true crime fans. I'm your host, Amanda Russell, and this is Colorado Crime. I cover cases from coast to coast with a special emphasis on cases that happen right here in colorful, crime-filled Colorado. Oh my gosh, you guys, you are the absolute best. I cannot thank you guys enough for all the positive feedback that I've received. I'm so happy that you guys are enjoying listening. Thank you to everyone who has shared this podcast with friends and family, and even with your students. It means the world to me. Seriously, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and February is Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. But it's come to my attention that I have some high school aged listeners, and I couldn't pass up the opportunity to speak to them about the dangers of teen dating violence, specifically breakup violence, because it is a form of domestic violence, and it's one that's not talked about enough. On the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence website, it's reported that 57% of teens know someone who has been physically, sexually, or verbally abusive in a dating relationship. 20.9% of female and 13.9% of male high school students report being physically or sexually abused by a partner. Only 33% of teenagers ever tell anyone about dating abuse they experienced. Now, domestic violence isn't always physical. It's willful intimidation, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, and controlling behavior. It can be having your partner demand to see your phone and read your messages. It can be demeaning comments. It can even be you being forced to share your location with your partner. If you find yourself making excuses like they had a bad day or they're only like this when they're with friends or normally they're really sweet, get out. Guys, I've been there, and I've said these exact same things. I'm speaking from experience here. I was 19 years old when I had a metal can of cleaning product thrown at me. I excused it. There were awful, hateful comments said. I lied to myself and said they wouldn't happen again. The final straw came when my pets were threatened. I left, and I never looked back. I was embarrassed and I felt so much shame. How could I let this happen to myself? But you know what? It wasn't my fault. And it took me years to understand that. But it was never about anything I did or didn't do. My abuser wanted control. And for a while, I let them have it, feeling like they were caring for me, loving me even. But ultimately, it came down to one thing control. The root of domestic violence is, at its core, control. I'm sharing my story with you today to show you that you're not alone. Reach out to someone, family, friends, law enforcement. If you need an ally in your corner, I'm here. You can email me, DM me on Instagram. I will help get you in contact with someone who can help. If you take One thing away from all my rambling, take this. You deserve better, and there is help available. Now, let's get into the case. Today's case took place in Loveland, Colorado in 2016. Ashley Doolittle was a newly 18-year-old who just graduated from high school and was looking forward to starting college at Colorado State University in the fall. Ashley was an avid horse lover. She began riding at five and was a very accomplished rider. She was named the 2016 Boulder County Fair Lady in Waiting and was posthumously crowned the 2017 Queen. She was kind, energetic, and smart. She would have gone on to do great things. Unfortunately, her murderer, Tanner Flores, stole her from her parents and her brother, and this world. Tanner was an 18-year-old high school dropout who had been dating Ashley for about a year. 
The couple began having frequent arguments and seemed less close than they previously had. Flores became increasingly jealous, suspicious, and controlling over Ashley. On June 5, 2016, the couple decided to take a hike at Gem Lake in Estes Park. Flores testified that things seemed normal for the couple, but a few hours after they returned, Ashley seemed to distance herself from Flores. The pair met with friends on Sunday evening at a local restaurant and Flores felt that Ashley was ignoring him. Instead of giving her the space she so clearly needed, he pressed the issue. Flores followed Ashley to the bathroom where she was headed with a friend. Flores wasn't going to continue to be ignored. He grabbed Ashley by the arm, spun her around, and whispered into her ear. Ashley proceeded to the bathroom and Flores waited on the bench, crying. Ashley's friend left the bathroom first and told Flores to wait outside the restaurant for Ashley to come talk to him because Ashley needed some space. Flores proceeded to wait outside in his truck for an hour while Ashley stayed inside. Ashley left with a friend, never stopping to talk to Flores. Apparently, a phone call was exchanged between the two, and Ashley made the brave decision to end the relationship. This blindsided Flores. Flores was reportedly distraught. He was unaware that there was any trouble between the two, but took advantage of a pact the two previously made. The couple had agreed when they first started dating that if one wanted to break up, they would meet the next day to discuss their reasoning. On Monday, June 6, the two met to discuss what their next step would be. Flores told investigators that the two rekindled their relationship and, quote, had gotten back together. He stated from the witness stand at trial, quote, I think it was clear to her, too, that we were back together. Okay, let's discuss this for a second. If you're not 100% sure that you're in a relationship, I am 100% sure that you're not. Ashley isn't here to defend her side of the story. Remember who we're hearing this from. We're hearing this from the person who snuffed her light out, that she was madly in love with him still. Hmm. He goes on to state that she, quote, talked about how she still wanted to get married and get a house together and have kids. I call bullshit. I can't speak for her. However, I would venture to say that she was afraid, even if subconsciously, that he was unstable and that could have led to her reason as to why they got back together. On June 7th, Ashley went back to the restaurant with her friends and told Flores not to come or she would break up with him. Flores's attorney tried to slander Ashley's character and imply that she was cheating on Flores. Later text messages exchanged between the two show Ashley denying any suspected wrongdoing. Let me mention, though, that Flores didn't refrain from attending out of respect for Ashley. He actually couldn't attend because he locked his keys in his truck and had to break in with a screwdriver. On June 8th, Flores decided to look through an unsuspecting Ashley's phone. He stated that Ashley had been communicating with other males in a flirtatious manner. Side note here, there are other names that are mentioned in the case, but I won't be naming any of them publicly. Instead, I will call them male one or male two or friend. While these other people were integral to the investigation and the trial, their names don't change Ashley's story. So, out of respect for their privacy, no names will be given. Flores called and confronted male one who was texting Ashley and was informed that Ashley said she was single and Flores should reach out to another male, male two, who'd been in contact with Ashley. Male two was a year older than Ashley and had spent some time recently with her, as well as about three hours with her the night before her murder. Ashley heard that Flores was checking into her whereabouts and decided that she was finally and officially done dating him and ended their relationship via phone call. Flores became enraged, and it was apparent that he was not going to go silently. According to text messages Flores sent to Ashley, he stated, quote, 
You probably cheated on me. I hope you realize what you threw away. I gave you everything and spent so much money on you. You were nothing near loyal. I'm going to go do something stupid now. Bye. Ashley responded to Flores by saying, quote, I never cheated on you. I never did anything with anyone else while we were together. Our relationship has been over for a long time. I wanted to be friends, but that isn't possible. Flores came by Ashley's house on Wednesday afternoon to get some jewelry he had purchased for her, as well as to pick up some jackets. While there, Flores informed Ashley's mom that Ashley was pursuing relationships with other guys. Okay, guys, let's be real for a second. If your relationship has come to an end, trust me when I say your ex's parents know exactly what's going on. You're not telling them anything new. After Flores left Ashley's house, he met up with a friend and they drank a beer together. His friend told investigators, quote, He told me him and Ashley had been fighting. He was upset about it, not angry, but sad. He felt like things were falling apart. She was talking to other guys. We didn't get into much detail about it. While Flores was drinking with his friend, he was also texting Ashley and pleading with her to meet up with him the next day. Ashley was with a friend during this time, hanging out, having dinner, and Flores was simultaneously texting the friend she was with about their relationship woes. At a bonfire that was hosted by Flores' friend, Flores spoke to Ashley's friend and told her he was going to kill himself. He also made advances towards her, where she was forced to tell him that nothing was going to happen between the two. After this encounter, Flores returned to his friend, who stated Flores seemed, quote, fine, normal, quiet. He seemed fine to me. Tanner talked about seeing Ashley the next day. He said they were going to meet up and talk about things. Ashley was friends with many people, boys and girls alike. One of the males that Flores accused her of cheating on him with went on to tell investigators, quote, there was constant flirting and teasing, but nothing developed of it. This is allowed. She's 18, and it was so apparent to everyone except for Flores that their relationship had run its course. Flores went on to send a text message to Ashley's friend stating, quote, she's with blank or someone. I know she is. June 9th, 2016 started like any other day. Ashley awoke to a text message from Flores asking if they could still meet up at Lawn Hagler Reservoir that morning. Ashley had some errands to run first and they planned to meet up later that afternoon. While Ashley ran errands and went about her day, Flores was taking steps to ensure Ashley would know how he was feeling. Flores took a revolver from his father's locked gun safe and placed it in his vehicle. He went to Carter Lake and shot with no particular target. Flores would later claim that he was there to relieve some stress. Investigators argued that Flores shot the gun only once to confirm it could fire, a necessary step in his plans to come. Flores argued that he brought much more ammunition than one and that he fired the gun at least seven times that morning. Investigators were unable to find any spent shell casings in the area Flores said he was shooting. Flores sent Ashley a text message that morning stating, quote, we are going to meet up tonight. I don't care when, but we are, okay? When she hadn't responded by noon, Flores texted Ashley again, quote, I miss you. She replied with, quote, stop. Flores was seen that morning by a friend making U-turn after U-turn near the location Flores would end Ashley's life in just a few short hours. Prosecutors argued Flores was scouting out an area where he could carry out his plan without interference from residents. Before Flores met with Ashley, he would stop at a gas station to fill his truck's gas tank 
in what prosecutors suggested was him prepping to flee after he killed Ashley. When Flores was arrested, he was several hours from Loveland at his deceased great-grandfather's property. Ashley returned from her errands and met with Flores. He picked her up from the tire shop and drove her to the credit union so she could deposit the money she received from friends and family for graduating high school just a few weeks prior. Flores returned Ashley back to her vehicle and they made the drive separately to Lawn Hagler Reservoir. At Carter Lake, Flores tried and tried to persuade Ashley to continue to date. She refused. Flores stated, quote, she wanted to go experience relationships with other people before getting married. Flores stated that Ashley exited the vehicle at one point during their conversation and threatened to walk back to her car, but he was able to persuade her to stay with him. He began the drive back to Ashley's car. Flores told investigators that he asked her for one final kiss, which she gave him. Flores stated, quote, she just kind of glared at me and turned away. So I grabbed the gun and shot her. While he drove, he reached into the back seat, pulled out his father's revolver, aimed it at Ashley, and pulled the trigger, shooting her once in the head. The first shot didn't kill Ashley immediately. Flores goes on to tell investigators, quote, She started twitching and freaking out, so I shot her again. I thought it would be an instant thing. After Flores was arrested in Mesa County, he told investigators that Ashley had glared at him, and that's why he shot her. Flores told investigators that he planned to kill Ashley and then commit suicide, but he, quote, lost his nerve when Ashley didn't die instantly after the first shot. Flores started driving towards his deceased great-grandfather's home in Colbran, Colorado, with Ashley's dead body next to him. Flores drove for four and a half hours with the supposed love of his life's lifeless body in the seat next to him. When he arrived to the home in Colbran, he took Ashley's body inside, stripped her clothes off, washed them, redressed her, cleaned all the blood off of her body, and fell asleep while cartoons played in the background. While Flores was making the long drive to Colbran, Ashley's mom was waiting for her to get home. At roughly 7.55 p.m. on the night of June 9th, Ashley's mom called police to report her missing. Ashley's mom explained that Ashley had recently broken up with her boyfriend. Investigators reached out to friends and family of Flores and were informed by Flores' father that his 22 caliber revolver was missing from the safe where it was kept and Flores had access to the key. He told investigators that Flores was probably headed to Colbran where his grandfather had property. Friends of Flores's told investigators that they had never seen Flores so depressed and that Flores sent Snapchats the previous night that were suicidal in nature. Investigators requested an emergency ping on both Flores and Ashley's phones. The data showed that Flores and Ashley's phones were within one mile of each other from 4.01 p.m. to 4.18 p.m. After that, Ashley's phone shows as inactive. Flores's phone continued to ping until about 7 p.m., and then his phone also went inactive. Investigators had reason to believe Flores was, in fact, headed to the Colbrand property, but they were hours behind him. While they came up with a plan, they reached out to the neighbor of the Colbrand property, who stated that she could see a male outside and believed it to be Flores. She stated that the male opened all the doors on the vehicle and pulled out a bundle from the back seat and set it on the ground. The neighbor told investigators that she believed she saw an arm sticking out of the bundle. Law enforcement arrived the next day at about 8.45 a.m. A perimeter was established and investigators waited to see what Flores would do next. Flores left the home for a bit during this time to throw something in a field. It was later discovered to be a blood-stained rag that tested positive for Ashley's DNA. 
SWAT deputies made contact when he returned to the property and Tanner Flores was arrested for the murder of Ashley Doolittle at 10.32 a.m. on June 10, 2016, after her deceased body was found in the back of his truck. Flores was charged with first-degree murder and second-degree kidnapping and was held at the Mesa County Jail until he was transferred to Larimer County Jail until his hearing. On October 5, 2017, after a seven-day trial and a 13-minute court appearance, Tanner Flores was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole plus 32 years for the murder and kidnapping of Ashley Doolittle. According to the Colorado Department of Corrections website, Tanner Flores will spend the rest of his life at Colorado Territorial Correction Facility in Canyon City, Colorado. In the end, a bright light was stolen from this world. A daughter, sister, and horse lover. Someone who was looking forward to beginning college and getting to grow up. Never getting to realize her dreams, watch her brother graduate, experience life after 18 because of someone else's selfish actions. For anonymous, confidential help available 24-7, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. Again, that's 1-800-799-7233. Thank you for tuning in this week. I'll be back next week with a new case. New episodes are released every Friday at 10.30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. Please follow me on Instagram at Colorado Crime Pod for updates on next week's case, as well as other true crime happenings. If you have any cases you would like me to cover, please send me an email at amanda at coloradocrimepodcast.com. I hope you have a beautiful day wherever you are, and as always, stay safe.